Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about type 1 diabetes, and this is a very common disease, so many of you probably know a lot about it, but there's a lot of information that some of you may not know. So, to start off, let's talk about cell communication. So, cells communicate with each other, and they have to do this to survive. There's two ways they do it, local and long distance. In long distance, endocrine signaling releases hormones to travel to target cells. But in local signaling, they communicate directly by connecting to a cytoplasm. And I'm going to show an example of this. So, okay. So, basically, cell communication is like the telephone game we used to play. And it starts with you. Okay, now whisper. Why can you whisper? Okay, I'm going to hear you. This month is World Diabetes Day. Okay, that's wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, sit down. That's a so, so pretty much the message, the message, the message became distorted as it traveled down. It's supposed to be November 14th is World National Diabetes Day. So this shows how communication can get messed up. Okay. So ligands play a big role in this. They bind to a cell receptor in the signal transduction pathway. So in my disease, the insulin would be the ligand because it binds to the insulin receptor. And when this happens, the cell can take glucose and use it for energy that your body needs. So calcium ions stimulate insulin release in the blood and cyclic AMP are used to enhance the release from the beta cells. And beta cells are very important in producing insulin. They are the only ones that do that. And this is where my breakdown occurs. So in the immune system, the cells communicate with the beta cells. But to be more specific, the T cells. So in type 1 diabetes, the islets, which is this, um, they have the beta cells in them and alpha cells. So the T cells go in and invade them, and they mistakenly attack the beta cells. So once this happens, the beta cells can no longer produce insulin, so your body has little or no insulin, which is very important because insulin is um, there. It helps keep the blood sugars level, so it won't get too high or too low. And a good analogy for this is it's kind of like the cell has a door, and the door is locked. So the insulin is the key that will unlock the door so the glucose can travel through. Well, in type 1 diabetes, there is no way to unlock the cell. So there's no way for glucose to travel through. There is four different categories of insulin. Um, the first one being rapid acting. So once you take it, it takes about 15 minutes to start working, and it'll last up to three to four hours. There's short acting, and it will start working in about 30 to 60 minutes and last five to eight hours. In intermediate acting, it starts working one to two hours after you take it and lasts about 14 to 16 hours. And the longest one is long acting because it starts working in two hours and lasts 24 hours or more. So as I mentioned, alpha cells are a part of the islets as well. So alpha cells release glucose from the liver and fatty acids from fat tissues. They also produce hormones and they regulate glucose levels. So the symptoms of diabetes is kind of how they diagnose it. You can diagnose it yourself and then you can go to the doctor. So when you have these symptoms, you have frequent urination, and that's because the body's sending all the glucose to the kidneys, resulting in frequent urination. And you're losing a lot of water, so it causes you to be very thirsty. And there's no glucose getting into the cell, so there's no energy being produced. So you're very drowsy. And another symptom is blurred vision, which is because glucose builds up, and when it builds up, it goes in your front of your eyes, causing your vision to be blurred. And the mood changes caused because you have high glucose levels or low glucose levels. Then weight loss happens because of the dehydration and the calories from the sugar that isn't being used. And dark patches on the skin is because there's too much insulin in the blood, so it shows physically. So this disease starts usually in childhood or adolescence, but there is two peaks that it's usually diagnosed. So you could be diagnosed from four to seven, 
or you could be diagnosed from 10 to 14. And it does take some years off of your life. Men will lose about 11 and women will lose about 13. But however, there have been people that have lived 85 years or older. So the transmission, this is how you get it. And there's not really the exact way they don't really know how you get it, but there are things that trigger it, such as environmental factors, and this is viruses like mumps can cause the beta cell damage, and genetic factors also can trigger this. So the HLA genes are the big part of it. They produce the proteins that keep you healthy. Well, if you look over here, it's the H, the DRB1, DQA1, and DQB1 on the HLA class two are the main risk factors and they're all located on chromosome six. So those are really what start the trigger of the autoimmune attack. Here's some statistics. So the chances are, if you are a man and you have type one diabetes, the odds of your child getting diabetes is one in 17. So it's greater in men getting, their child getting it than women. But if you're a woman and you have a child before you're 25, your risk is one in 25. And if you have it after, your risk is one in 100. So there are different ways they test for diabetes. As I said, it's usually looking at the symptoms, but there are some different tests. This is glycated hemoglobin, and it's a blood sample, and they see um, the amount of sugar attached to the hemoglobin. And if, for you that don't know, hemoglobin is oxygen-carrying protein in the red blood cells. And then they also have continuous glucose monitoring. And that's this right here. And you can do that yourself and it tracks glucose levels throughout the day. And here's some in, here is, oh. Here's a timeline of very important events that happened in history. So in 1921, insulin was able to control diabetes in dogs. And I actually did not know that dogs could get diabetes, but that happened. And then they were able to move forward on January 11th in 1922 and developed insulin for the first time as a treatment. And in 1940, the American Diabetes Association was founded. And that's where a lot of this information came from because they do a lot to support and raise awareness. In 1966, the first pancreas transplant was performed and it was successful. And here are some interesting facts that type 1 diabetes actually tends to increase when you're away from the equator. This is because the colder areas, like winter and all that, they actually cause it to develop more often, and it's more prone to then. So that was kind of cool. So we're kind of good by the equator. Then when you inject it, you can't really inject it in the same place. And this is because when you do, it can cause hard lumps or extra fat deposits to form. Caucasians actually have the highest risk, which is interesting and every 10 seconds someone can die from diabetes. These are some stories of some people that have diabetes and basically what they're saying is it does take over their lives but they don't let it stop them. And also I wanted to talk about this over here. It's a blue, blood, glucose me, blood glucose meter and what you do is you prick your finger and you place it on a sheet and these sheets cost about hundred dollars a month. So whenever you use it and you put it in, it goes in there and tells you your blood sugar levels so you can know if you need to take sugar or cut back. And diabetes is just a well-known disease, but not many people know that it can be tragic to some people's lives, but it never lets them stop doing the stuff they enjoy. Yeah.